Wonderful. Okay. Well, I would like to take a moment as we begin to officially welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for today's conversation. My name is Kalia Garrido and I head up marketing and events here at Great Data Minds. Um, if you haven't already met us in some capacity, way, shape, or form, uh, Great Data Minds is a collective of passionate data activists. And we are on a mission to modernize the world of data. We do this in two ways. The first is that we have a services arm that's at greatdataminesinnovationlabs.com. This is where we do our strategic planning, education, and the deployment of critical data projects. And then over on this side of the house, this is greatdataminds.com. This is where we host great events, just like the one you're going to listen to today. We um, create content. This is our community and our conversation. Uh, today, oh, let's get, we're going to get Ed in here. Um, and so this is where we host, like I said, all our events, just like the one that we're going to be running today. So a little bit of housekeeping as we get started. Um, as you can very well tell, we have your cameras and microphones on today, and we do want to hear from you. This is a collaborative discussion by intent. But my goodness, people, please use your superpower with discretion. We can off if you have your camera on, we can see you. If you have your mic on, we can hear you. Um, and I know we all have big feelings and passionate opinions about generative AI. Um, so we're going to welcome the conversation. We're going to welcome the questions. You can do this in the chat. You can chime in throughout the session. You can ping me if you want um, me to insert something. Uh, and then we'll also leave a little bit of time at the end of the session for a more formal Q and A. Um, you know, some more, a few minutes there. So if you'd like to hold your mm -hmm. thoughts until after the panel, you can certainly do that too. Okay, so today we are uh, filming our next episode and podcast for our happy hour series. This is where we gather up some big thinkers on controversial topics. And today we've got a great <laughs> panel and we're gonna talk through some of the hottest topics uh, of all, uh, especially today, generative AI. So let me do a, a brief introduction for who we have on the line. First, we have Mr. Bill Franks back, back joining us again. Bill in the red shirt, thank you so much for joining us. Bill is the director at the Center for Statistics and Analytical Research within the School of Data Science and Analytics um, at Kennesaw State University. He is also the Chief Analytics Officer for the International Institute for Analytics. He serves on a whole advisory boards. He's an established author of multiple books, and he's a well-known thought leader in our data and analytics space. Um, and so today, Bill is the guy who considers AI from an ethical capacity. So Bill, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having um, me. We, we love having you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, got, got a few more people coming in. Uh, then we have Bruce Bugby. Bruce is a first time guest to the show. Bruce, thank you so much for being our victim today. Uh, Bruce <laughs> is the Vice President of Data Science at Caliber Mine, which is a best in class customer data platform. Uh, Bruce has key ownership for shaping and implementing the company's data integrity strategy. And he also leads the development of efforts around ML related product features. So Bruce is going to be the one with us today who considers um, AI from a professional capacity. Bruce, thank you for joining us. Re really excited to be here. All right. And then we have Tyler Albright. And Ty it's not Tyler's first rodeo with us, but he's back again. He's the managing director at AE Group. Um, and Tyler has done just about every job in enterprise IT and data with data organizations, but he finds that his happiest place is simply solving problems with software. And so Tyler is the expert today on the line for who can, um, the one who considers AI in a personal capacity. Tyler, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. <laughs> and of course, our very own Mr. Mike Lampa. Mike Lampa is our Chief Analytics Officer here at Great Data Minds and GDM Innovation Labs. He has got a ton of strategic and practical data and analytics experience, both as an enterprise user and a consultant, working with some of the world's most prestigious brands. Um, and Mike is the guy today who, much like myself, considers AI in the wow is this now real life capacity. Mm -hmm. Wow Mike. is this now. <laughs> what are we doing? Okay, the floor is yours, sir. Well, thank you very much. Gentlemen, thanks for joining me. I was really um, quite pleased that the panel showed up. Can you imagine moderating when there's nobody on the panel? Anyway, my favorite job is washing windows. Right? 
And I'm trying to figure out how generative AI can help me get there uh, in the most effective way. That's going to be the theme for today's discussion. Questions? I, I, feel like, I feel like Tyler will be able to actually answer that. All right. So let's start out. I didn't know we were talking about robots, but it sounds fun. Let's go. Yeah, yeah right. All right. Um, do you use ammonia water or do you use Windex? I'm not sure. All right. Let's open this up by first, how about if we level set with what is generative AI? What is large language model? And know what better place to get this intelligence than to hit my co-pilot, chat GPT. So I asked the question, help me compare and contrast generative AI versus large language models. Here's what chat has to say. Well, they're both, Similar concepts, very highly related, but they got very distinct focuses. Generative AI, from a purpose standpoint, focuses on creating new and original data, such as images, music, text, videos, um, that resembles or is very similar to existing data. So it's this creation engine kind of thing. The techniques being used, um, this is a new one on me. Um, it uses various algorithms and models, such as the generative ed adversarial network the gains new for me i didn't know that one um but to generate that content using learning patterns and uh using structured from um training data right it, the applications are around image synthesis text generation video generation deep fake creation and creative content generation so it's kind of broad um, and its outputs are very diverse, as you might suspect from it, as opposed to large language models, which primarily focuses around nat natural language processing and generation tasks, such as understanding and generating human-like text. Uh, the techniques that it uses around lar large uh, uh, modeling techniques, rather, a lot of deep learning architectures, um, using vast amounts of text to learn the grammar and the syntax and the context and the semantics of the human language. Uh, so its applications are in the chat box, the virtual assistant, my co-pilot, Tyler's mini-me. It's, it's a very, very valuable uh, little tool. It's all, you know, my experience so far is it's Google on steroids when I ask it a question. So because it's very text oriented, uh, um, they're, they're specifically designed for processing and generating text as opposed to generative AI, which is, has a much more diverse output. For, so from a difference uh, perspective, if I was to contrast them, the focus is different. Generative AI is much broader, whereas large language models are more focused around text processing, language processing. The data types you know, go right along with that. The training data is, slight, uh, is different where I'm gonna use a diverse set of training data for generative AI, whereas large language models, they're looking for corpuses, large volumes of text uh, from which it can uh, uh, infer and generate and um, uh, uh, create human-like dialogue for ourselves. All right, that's my summary from my buddy, the co-pilot, uh, panel, I'd like to ask you, can you offer a little bit of additional color commentary around there from your perspectives? And Tyler, I'm going to start with you, my friend. Cool. Well, I think chat DPC did a pretty good job there, but, um, I, I think there's a couple of things that you hear if you look at the news, right? One is like, it's the end of the world. It's like, it's, it's Terminator, right? That it's sentient. Um, and then the other side of the world is like, eh, it's just, it's just fancy, uh, like I message predictive text. All it is is just a giant uh, predictive text. And the reality is I think there's, it, it's sort of, at least in my mind, fitting in this happy medium, right? So I think first off, it is at the base when you talk about, I'll, I'll, I'll use like chat GPT just contextually here. It's, um, it is a massive predictive text engine, right? Which is just sort of billions of vectors trying to figure out what every character you put, like what your short-term kind of history is, what are you likely to do next? I think the, the breakthrough that OpenAI did and then you know, others have followed suit is, is sort of the layering of additional models on top of that, right? So um, ChatGPT actually did something where they, they inserted humans sort of in the middle to pretend to be the large language model. And like, what, what do I mean by that? 
It's like they were looking at all these responses and they're like, well, let's get a human in there and let's have the human actually say and choose what they would want to the response of this intelligent assistant or this intelligent <laughs> yeah. chat to respond. So there was a huge amount of training in the case of OpenAI there to essentially build human-esque models for, you know, again, I'm trying to keep this at, at a really high level that informs or instructs sort of the lower level, just kind of brute force large language models. So um, or someone on Twitter, actually, I thought it explained it pretty well is there's layers of these machine learning models um, so you have AI sort of at the bottom and then you have like humans sort of inserted to pretend to be AIs in the middle to kind of like help model and direct it. And then you have an AI at the top that pulls everything together. So, so you, it, it's not just as simple as predictive. And this is where I think, and, and I'll get into this later, just sort of from a personal productivity, right? This is what's so amazing about ChatGPT is it seemingly understands, right? It's more than just picking the next thing to say, like it, it has this ability to um, to sort of understand and respond very contextually what you're asking. And that's that's really the humans in the middle of that modeling process that um, they were adding that sort of instruction understanding bit to it. So, awesome. um, but yeah, I'll leave it at that. All right. More to come from Tyler. I'm with Tyler. Hey, Bruce, you're up next. Any additional color commentary you'd like to put in or rebuttal? We no, I, 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 <laughs> uh, no, I agree 100% with everything Tyler was mentioning there. And in general, I think the important thing that is always front of mind when I'm thinking about these is that there is, while the, the out, input and output mechanisms might seem dramatically different between things of image, text, speech, audio, video, code, anything like that, these we're in this world where we're starting to really develop these underlying modularities and it's you're getting a lot of blank to blank type models i saw some stuff popping up in the chat but a lot of these use cases are fine tuning these techniques of training and building these models and learning how to leverage this common idea of embeddings and similarity to move from one mod modality to another you've seen most notably with things like text to image text to video text to text which is large language models but even more abstract abstract concepts like text to code to text to data analysis text to all sorts of things where you're trying to generate something that is semantic semantically meaningful and accurate so it's really interesting seeing what is essentially the world's biggest collection of advanced legos starting to get pieced together so uh we'll probably talk about this more later on but it's really these concepts seem dramatically different like how is an image the same as text but under the hood there these similarities are driving some really interesting connections and a lot of the times when we're talking and interacting with these things text is really just our mechanism of communication to yeah. these things because i can't I'm not, I'm sure I could draw a picture in some of these models and it would try to do some inference and map it to an embedding space and do all that. But text is really my way of expressing intent and trying to work with these assistants, co-pilots, these models themselves. So it's mm. really an interesting time. Yeah, no kidding. All right. Thank you, Bruce. And Bill, how about you from your perspective, sir? Yeah, I'll just throw in, I think it it follows on what, what's been said and it's the most common mis perception, I think, about how these models work is people are used to, if you go to a Google and you put in a term, it's going to go out and find documents, web pages, et cetera, that actually exist that appear to match what you're asking for. So it may do a better or worse job at, at achieving that, but what it's going to return are actual documents, actual pages. Whereas when you get into a large language model like the ones that underlie ChatGPT, it's literally the term generative AI is literal. It's generating text probabilistically word by word uh, based on the mathematical structure of your question. What's the most likely mathematical structure of the output? And so people think that it's, quote, thinking much more than it really is. And that's where you lead to things like these hallucinations that have been written about where it makes stuff up because probabilistically, it's very likely that, you know, uh, this journal had a paper of this name based on the context of the question. So it, it, it'll sort of make it up. So I think it's that, mm. that knowledge of exactly what it's doing. Uh, people have to be aware of if they're going to use it properly. And there's, you know, you can find stories all over the news of people 
having things go horribly wrong by not understanding that. Oh yeah, <laughs> and and I'm sure we'll we'll probably uncover and share a few of those as we go along today. All right, guys. So thank you. So general foundational understanding and context for us to have the rest of our our, our panel discussion. So let's get in. The, the, the first question I have around is there are there some known or emerging use cases that we're seeing for these technologies? Uh, and you know, Bruce, I'm going to start with you. And then uh, Tyler, I would like to have you follow on. Um, yeah, I think so. The when it comes to sort of known or sort of the most readily accepted ones, because we're all everyone who's watching the news and following this, it seems like a new thing pops up every other week. There's a, a website that I use called there's an AI for that, which is literally just new products like popping up every couple of weeks. And I can tell they're all sort of different flavors of using these underlying technologies, which are starting to become commodified to try to address sort of specific problems. Um, as far as in general, the, a lot of the use cases that are gain, I've seen gaining a lot of like viability right now come to places where there's things like large scale summarization, classification, um, the ability to interact with lots of unstructured data. You're seeing uh, Microsoft's probably the fastest mover, one of the faster movers in the space because of their huge stake in open AI. So they have a $10 billion incentive to be fast in this space. Mm. And they're really leaning heavily both into branding and the idea of these co-pilots, which we already sort of mentioned. And so it's these, you take these sort of foundational models that power these underlying systems, you tune them to very specific tasks and you give users a more organic contextual experience for the side of their product. Um, so they can get into Word and sort of, it's uh, it's like the resurgence of Clippy to a degree from, from the nineties where you have oh this, gosh. like Clippy's back with a vengeance guys, but <laughs> it is something where you're not limited by a finite flow control of how these systems are structured. You can let a user sort of interact a little bit more meaningfully by trying to express what they need in plain language. And through these mechanisms that can be translated into something computer understandable and auto suggesting content features, development, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, GitHub Copilot's an excellent example of that where it's commonly being used to sort of power a lot of this like AI assisted code development. So the, the term assistant is really prevalent with these technologies right now. Other areas I've seen it. Um, and I mean, generative is really the key application there. So anything in the art, type space, audio, video, there's a, a huge growing amount of ease of use for generating artificial content that looks dramatically real, um, both for good and for bad. So that's raising a ton of questions on both sides of, wow, this is great. What else can we do with this versus, oh my gosh, this is going to flood everything with how will you tell reality? So it's going to be an interesting couple of years. Um, that's where I'm seeing a lot of these earlier use cases as far as like things that are being able to adapt commercially or get out into the market that have sort of a path to commercial or widespread adoption. Mm -hmm. um, companies are now are racing to figure out how to make their features smarter and take cognitive load off their users. And they're leveraging a lot of these things to do that right now. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Bruce. Tyler, how about from your perspective, what, what are some of the emerging use cases you're starting to see where you're getting value? Yeah, well, I'll kind of take the selfish angle there. So, you know, um, earlier in the year, so, you know, late February, early March, I, I decided that I was going to, you know, kind of go all in from sort of a daily productivity perspective and just run some experiments to see how this thing actually works. And um, it's just amazing how fast everything has progressed since I had some of those initial ideas. So Julie always likes to make the joke. I called it mini T for mini Tyler. I was my, my programming assistant. And I was playing with all the models, everything from voice to text. And, and, and sort of my goal was what, what is something that has visibility to my patterns of development and has visibility to my kind of local Git repositories? And could I use you know, one or, or many of these chat GPT sessions to basically approximate like a junior dev team? Um, so what are sort of tasks that I could kind of dole out as a team lead and could I get some acceleration there? And it, it's pretty fantastic. I have to say, you know, was, you know, I've obviously been reading a lot, seen everyone's reactions, and there's everything from it's stupid, it can't really code, like, you know, it, it writes bad code. Um, 
my my experience has been sort of the other side and you know again i've been coding for you know 30 some years so um it it has been a remarkably effective tool to the point where i actually feel guilty if i just want to like sit down and write something from my own brain um it, it and so it's this weird we can maybe talk about that later like what this really means like am i am i becoming more productive but am i becoming more intelligent and wise in terms of the things i can put together but um so then I started extending it, you know, I put together, uh, you know, a small little investment um, sort of corporation with my brother. We had to do some things in Wyoming and I'm like, oh, I have a lawyer, it's ChatGPT. And again, we're not, I know everyone's going to freak out. Like, how could you do this? But the very, very basic contracts, kind of the legal Zoom variety, but it, you know, it saved me 500 bucks. It's, it's, it just kind of, so I started, you know, mapping from, what if it was managing my calendar? What if it had some perspective to an email export? So I just, the, the things that I found myself spending a bunch of time doing in a mundane way, I kind of incorporated into this code base. And, and I've found that it went from sort of this novel thing that I had to kind of force myself to try to do the experiments and to make some notes on to sort of a go-to. Like it, it very quickly became sort of part of my particularly in the, in, in the software dev space, kind of part of my, my, daily, my daily cycle. Um, and the only thing I'll close up with that is there's a lot of other people doing this. And um, my, my feature set is just like every day I go in, I'm like, dang it, like where were these people three weeks ago? Because I spent all this time trying to code this thing up. And I just saw something yesterday, uh, which I think happened last week. If, if anyone uses, you guys are all data folks, so you've probably heard of PyCharm. But if you use the JetBrain suite, they're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, we found it too hard to like sort of do it outside of our tool set. So if you just hit this keyboard combination, like right in the middle of your Python file and sort of, you know, put in your chat request for the function, it's yeah, just skip all the intermediate, just drop in there so you can incorporate it and run it, which was some of the stuff I was playing with. So I kind of threw my hands up in the air and, and uh, everyone's catching up, but I've been really impressed just again, kind of like marching through different areas of really my work life and saying, how can this thing, you know, accelerate my productivity? And it really has. And that's, I think that's sort of a big thing that's scary to a lot of people and to a lot of professions. And, and it's sort of like, are you going to embrace it or are you going to like fight it? Um, I'm interested in like what, what, what people actually think about that, but, yeah. um, but I'm, I'm impressed and I'm going to, I'm going to keep plugging at it. Yeah. 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 I'm just going to you know, double down a little bit on that. Uh, uh, I, you know, wearing my data architect hat, which I haven't been wearing all that much an, anymore um, as, as I age, uh, but I did feed in a use case to chat GBT and it produced a target data model. It gave me my facts and dimensions. It even offered up a bunch of attributes inside there, which I didn't give it any insight into. Um, and uh, told me the kind of uh, uh, analytics and metrics I should be calculating and, and presenting. It's like, all right, that works. <laughs> so. Very I think just, yeah. just following on that, Mike, I think there's a lot of these things that we spend a lot of time doing that, frankly, add a lot of value, like, but are, are so repeatable, but in a, in the past, sort of in a difficult way. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of amazing when you like accelerate yourself that way. And I'm sure there was an edit cycle in there, right? I'm sure you oh, wanted sure. to and, like tweak this and that, so that, that that's part of it. But in terms of like an accelerating tool, don't even get me started on writing. Not that I, of course, I've always written perfect unit test cases and automated them. Like I've never <laughs> skipped on those and all my dev documentation has always been perfect, but it does all of that for me now. Like mm -hmm. all of it. Like I don't even, I don't even pretend to start to write doc strings or write tests now. I just feed it in and say, hey, learn this function. Yeah, sorry you didn't write it, but do <laughs> all that stuff that keeps program managers happy and makes me sad. So it's, um, yeah, you just keep threading out and it's it's amazing the things that it can accelerate you through. Yeah, 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 yeah I'm stunned. All right, so lots of cool opportunity without a doubt. Um, and some uh, uh, endorsements from people who's, who, whose opinion I value incredibly deeply. Um, but Bill and Bruce, what should we be aware of as we start to lean in on taking advantage of this technology? I mean, it's the hype is awesome, right? But what should we be uh, kind of aware of? I won't say wary of, because that's going to be the next uh, question. 
I, Go ahead, I think Bruce. one thing is is making I'm sure you're uh, making sure you're really aware of the policies of whichever model you're interacting with and the, the, the company behind it. So for example, I know this is changing by the week. So um, it wasn't long ago that there was issues where people were putting proprietary company data into say chat GPT, but then in doing so you're giving them rights to use that as training data, which led to some pretty substantive legal issues. So, you know, uh, rumor has it they're, they're, they are about to or are, are now adding options to do that. I saw one of the comments came in about that the Microsoft Copilot functionality is going to have that embedded. So I think we definitely need to have guardrails put in place where people can control how the information that you're putting in. You know, that whole story you, you just gave, Tyler, think of all the personal and corporate information you put in in various forms. As long as that's protected, then we're fine. But but is it today? And and uh, that's what I'd say is I don't know. Right. The the language is very complicated. The agreements are changing quickly. And so that's I think what I would recommend to someone more than anything is be cautious initially until some of this is clarified and or have your legal team review some of this and get clearance. I know several large Fortune 500 companies who have banned for now the use of some of these tools because they're worried about the IP infringement and or turning over of, of uh, data. Whether they're paranoid or not, I don't know, but it's, uh, you know, there's a there's some founded basis for them. I, I would say that uh, my lawyer said it was okay, but I just let everyone know that Chad GPT is my lawyer, so I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, Bill. Bruce, you, you wanna add on top of uh, Bill's thoughts? Yeah, I think at the the broader sense, and this is this has been a issue with as ML and AI have become more widely viewed as these golden solutions to problems, not just with the current incarnation of LLMs and transformer models and, and sort of where we're at in the sort of rapid upswing, but in all the froth around the ML AI space is that sort of the the abdication of human insight or a willingness to own a decision where I think so, there is some value placed on quote unquote, an ML powered system or a data powered system in that it completely removes a person from the decision-making process. So in the search for objective rationality, you end up just sort of blindly following the instructions of an uncaring box. And that's like, that's always been the fear I've had with like AI or ML systems in general, because these things are only ever as good as they're trained. Um, there's a whole host of issues from just silly, like nonsensical problems to broader issues of discrimination or sensitivity or um, a whole host of issues. But with these sort of more rapidly evolving things, it's the, um, these are levers to be used that can really rapidly upskill people, bridge productivity gaps, and really can be super valuable with concerns in there as well. Mm -hmm. However, um, if you just are like, I've done a similar thing as Tyler is like, I used a lot of this stuff to help me migrate some legacy code out of a language I didn't want to write in and something else. And it was great, but there were definitely times I had to be like, whoa, you're not doing the right thing. And if I just like copy and paste everything, wipe my hands, went and had a beer and called it a day, it's like nothing works. It's, um, it's, mm -hmm. it's like a very well-intended intern at times and really wanting to like, you don't give them the keys to production right away. That's how I, I would phrase it. So it's the mm -hmm. looking at these things and not blindly removing ourselves from the loop just because a machine that is very persuasive or has human characteristics tells us to, because mm -hmm. it speaks very authoritatively by design. And it will say, this is the thing, unless you tell it expressly, it's not, but it's it will be confidently wrong in many cases. So it's just be wary understand what you're asking like use it as a tool and not just as a uh, uh a scapegoat for you not having to like think about anything yeah right so keep yourself in the loop right, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly all right so you're kind of you're um filing on on top of that what are some of the mounting concerns that that you guys are either experiencing yourself as you're starting to work with it and, and being amazed at the capabilities of the technology or that you're picking up in, your, in conversation or in your research. Uh, Tyler, I want to start with you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, 
I'll, I'll just ditto what Bruce just said there, right? I think I think the concern for for companies and and teams and individuals, particularly in the enterprise space, is that it is so seemingly authoritative, right? And I think it takes a certain, you know, I, I would say that humans in general, you know, we're we're all different, we're we're, we're very diverse, and you know, there's there's like a critical thinking path that. There's people like me, as my wife calls me the super challenger, like I almost believe nothing, almost to my detriment, right? So I'm very challenging, like I want to understand things. And, you know, I have two different kids that are on opposite ends of that spectrum, right? So that there's this, there's like a needed discipline that, and, and again, this is a difficult thing. I'm not saying I have a solution. I'm just just kind of doubling down on that observation that it it is not a human. It is not necessarily authoritative, right? So this whole notion that there has to be a human in the loop is an absolute. You know, when I just described that personal experience, you know, 20 years ago when I was managing a bunch of junior developers on dev teams, I didn't throw all their code when they, you know, when they threw it back over the fence into production, right? Like we did code reviews, we made sure it worked and we talked about testing, made sure it all plugged in. You know, what, so what I've been doing my experiments the last couple of months, I haven't been blindly throwing this stuff in. Um, you know, I've been sort of doing like a personalized code review, right? So. Obviously, that's just one use case, but yeah, you have to have certainly for the near term. Certainly, when we don't have, you know, any of these oracles right out there, like it's it's something we. There was obviously a massive challenge. That's a rabbit hole. So sorry, but a massive challenge. Just what does objective truth look like on the internet anyway? Even before AI came in, right? So now mm -hmm. we just have. I've seen some of these comments, right? Like we have a tool that this makes some of that very very good looking bad information, um, you know very authoritative looking right so so yeah you have to have that discipline and and like we said like treat it like a tool not like a person i, I don't know it, it, you know it it because it is a very powerful tool but you know it can it can lead you astray if you if you're not being critical to it i got you yeah, yeah. hey bill what, what from your perspective yeah what are i see two things I, I see attacks with with this technology from from two sides one i'll call a, for lack of a term an injection attack which is this because something like chat gpt is probabilistically giving you an answer based on all of its training data well documented heavily documented consistently documented topics are going to come back with very consistent probably highly accurate answers and it's going to be very hard to make the tool change those answers but less documented things let's say mike you decide to run for your local city council there's not a whole lot relatively speaking of data on you out there if you know, uh, in the in the uh, internet we could get a couple hundred people to go post a bunch of documents claiming things about you that gets fed through the training model now probabilistically it the chat gpt is going to believe that you were a felon or that you um you know did some something and i could see where just like there's bots that do denial of services attacks, we'll have people getting bot armies that are going out writing documentation that <laughs> will make whatever claim you want become the most probable answer. And then the flip of that, of course, is generating deep fakes, which I think have been an issue for a while. Um, you know, I, I said about five years ago, I thought that an election would soon be changed by a deep fake. I don't, I don't think that's happened yet, but I'll be surprised if in the next couple of years, somewhere in the world, a candidate that's in the lead and clearly going to win is going to have a video or audio come out that ruins their candidacy. And by the time it's proven that that was a completely bogus uh, item, it'll be it'll be too late. So I think mm -hmm. that's the risk we're at as well. It's just we used to be able to believe anything that we saw or that we heard. And we're getting to the point now I can see it and hear it. But unless I was there live looking at your face as you did it, I have to question even posting this on YouTube, theoretically. You could have somebody come in and censor and edit and change what we've said and make it look like that's what we actually said. Oh, man. What is my reaction? Throw in some, uh, I, I don't know if you guys saw this. I think it came out today, just to kind of bring your point, Bill, to today. Um, I forget it was like a DeSantis super PAC or something, but they did an ad like critical of Trump today that, that was released. And again, I'm not, this is just, just a story. And there were two AI generated images out of the whole ad. It was like a 30 second ad where, you know, Trump was hugging Fauci and they were fake images. They weren't, they weren't real. And, you know, so then you have to ask this question, you know, it was actually, um, it was community noted in Twitter. 
and a whole bunch of people are upset. So then you have to ask all these questions. It's like, well, did they pick just two images because they were trying to be malevolent or did they just query the web and find AI generated images? Or, you know, you just, you kind of cast doubt into sort of the whole veracity of the whole ad, whatever you think about any of the players. But I was just saying like, what you're talking about is sort of already happening softly, right? And mm -hmm. um, you can only imagine when you know, these, these models kind of suck at, at sort of just straight up video, if you've seen any of that, but you can imagine with how fast this is moved by the time you get to the next, if not this presidential cycle by the next one, it's gonna be trivial to do the things that you're discussing. So mm -hmm. um, it's very valid. Very valid. Yep. Concern. Brave new world we wake up to every morning, huh? Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna go back now. We talked a little bit earlier about you know, some of the known or e emerging use cases. Um, expanding upon that, Bruce, um, is what's the spectrum of engagement as we're looking at the applic applicability, you know, it's going to be easy for me to say applicability, thank you, um, <laughs> of the technology, right? Um, I mean, I, I think it really depends. I'm, I'm a big believer that, like we're saying, the, like, one of the, the, I, this is changing day to day, week to week. From what I can see, one core belief that I'm really starting to hold is that going back to this idea of assistants and co-pilots is that one of the biggest shifts we'll probably see over the next five, 10 years is just has sort of a somewhat fundamental change in how we interface with a lot of products, services, technologies, com like computational things, things, any mostly digital world, primarily because of this ability to pull ourselves out of configuration screens, menus as much, and maybe abstract that into assistant based things. I think this was always the hope with early stages of Alexa and Siri and Cortana and like, hey, I can talk to my, my machine. But um, those typically, like, while having a lot of like ML powering behind them, especially on the speech recognition side, there's, there's this limited functionality and sort of pre described. So I think we'll see a more expansive version of that with how people interact with these technologies without even knowing it. it's just the oh, I need to set up a new profile on this thing. I just ask it to, or I tell it what I'm trying to do. And it's able to smooth that out. It's going to become uh, conversational interfaces will become a lot easier to implement and commodified. A lot of big vendors are starting to commodify the tooling around these things. So where it's to set up a chat bot or an enterprise grade search thing with your Google cloud provider or user, it's dramatically simpler with the stuff they have coming out in their early access program. And it's just like, pop it right on your website, point at your knowledge base, have it crawl your website. and You've got a virtual agent that people can talk to. And these mm -hmm. things are gonna continue to evolve. Yeah. So I think those will become a lot more prevalent. Then you'll just see a lot of the sort of the proliferation of all the various different actual product features and capabilities and sort of emergence of new fields that really just weren't probably viable or scalable to like from a commercial setting from like people to interact with mm -hmm. uh in just augmenting the things they're doing um things are becoming smarter i, I see a, i get a lot of like video editing TikToks sometimes and it's the ai tools around that is amazing same with the photo editing stuff it's like i remember old versions of photoshop trying to remove a background and just like, it, it's doable but like i had to know the skills and process now it's like click a couple buttons, you can pull stuff out. It's just making them so much easier to use. So mm -hmm. I think we're going to see those proliferate in very targeted use cases where we're already seeing a lot of it and it's going to ramp up even more. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, truly amazing. All right, so is all this just a hype cycle? And by the way, does Gardner still do their hype cycle? I haven't seen one in a couple of years. I'm not sure. But is this thing real? Is it going away or is it a hype? And I'm going to start with you, Bill. Well, I mean, I think it, it's absolutely uh, here to stay, all of these technologies, and we're only just beginning to figure out how to use them. So um, I guess, you know, I, I like to think through some, and I've talked today a little bit about some of the ethical and legal and societal implications, but that doesn't mean that I think that we are going to not proceed with them or that in fact we shouldn't right I, I thought it was kind of silly the other uh last month when a bunch of people come out and said we need to we need to freeze it we need to just stop because the reality is it's like a lot of other things even if a lot of the uh well-intended researchers stop based on requests like that the malicious 
researchers certainly aren't going to stop and they're just going to get the leg up on 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 everybody so mm. i think it's going to be here to stay i think what's going to be the most fascinating to me is how we end up adapting um the tools to to fit a little bit better into our you know our workflows and also i think they're going to become better at fact checking so one thing um i think the, the blog i posted today i talked about is the idea of um, adding and already doing it, adding the add ins that do different tasks. Find her. Find it, Kaylee. <laughs> oh, there's so many pages to scroll. I'm going to find it. And I'm going to die in the photo. You got it. Nailed it. All right. Thank you, Kaylee. <laughs> So we're oh so what I was saying was just that for example ChatGPT doesn't know how to do math, but mm -hmm. when you ask it a math question, it it could pass off that math to a computation engine. And uh, Wolfram Alpha has has created some add-ins that'll do that. So as we get these different add-ins to address the different weaknesses of the models, then you'll start to have kind of best of breed models handling different topics where you almost have a a master app. That's passing the the prompt components around to different places that it knows will be most accurate for that specific need. Mm -hmm. Awesome, Bruce. Additional thoughts there? Hype? Or is it going away? You no, I, 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 I. The, the closest analogies I've been finding to this sort of like a, a paradigm shift in technology. I don't want to be too much of a rah rah. We should be very wary, but when it comes to sort of foundational changes in like inflection points of how we interact with big technologies, this reminds me of web browsers. This reminds me of mobile phone, like iPhone level phones. This sort of feels like an inflection point. And maybe it's just because it's moving really fast and we're sitting right in it and there's some recency bias here. But these, these are the worst they're ever going to be. That's sort of the important context that I've, I've heard expressed a couple of times. And that is a sobering thought. So what, however, these really start proliferating, I think that they're, they're not going away. There is, it's too good at a lot of specific use cases. And now it's figuring out the right ways to tune them for the targeted problems we need them to. So just like we're talking about, like being able to route to different plugins and having that interface and being able to sort of give access where viable. Um, I think we're going to just see people leverage that more and more. Um, it goes back to sometimes I get worried it's going to be, I think we signed off our prep call with I'll have my robot talk to your robot. And that's sort of how <laughs> these things, you're going to get a lot of like robots generating content and then my robot summarizing content. And there's just this robot to robot layer in the middle of this game of telephone. So it's going to be really interesting to see, but I don't see it going away. Um, I think there will be some at the current state, there is, there's going to be a refinement of what is doable with the current versions of these technologies doable well and how to build product around that. Mm -hmm. But then after that, they're going to be targeting new potential areas and domains to expand these capabilities, especially things related to large swaths of unstructured data that are relevant to these models. Mm -hmm. You know, I got to tell you, Bruce, I just had the, the visual of the Rock'em Sock'em <laughs> robot game. <laughs> Tyler, I, I saw you nodding your head, Tyler. You want to throw, throw in a couple commentaries there? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I agree with, with, with both sets of comments. I, I, I think um, I, I kind of alluded to this a little bit in, in the chat, um, but, but just kind of playing on that plugin concept, I think, um, and we didn't talk about this, this is sort of getting nerdy, right? But the the, the sort of the short-term memory that you get to use in um, actually a few of these, but I'll just, I'll, I'll go back to GPT-4 has, um, has expanded like tenfold, right? In the last four weeks, like they, they opened that up. And so what does that mean? Um, you know, you can start to, if I, if I think from like a personal or from a corporate or from a very specific, you know, business case, right? You can, there's, there are several ways now for you to sort of uptrain, right, and add context and information to sort of inform kind of the higher levels of, of reasoning of, of like chat GPT. And, and this is really powerful. So like, this is a quick example. I um, wrote a paper on analytics like a long time ago, but it was the longest thing I had written. It was like, you know, 12,000 words, something like that. And I was able to sort of like instill that text 
into kind of the higher level memory. Again, I'm just trying to kind of keep these terms uh, kind, of, <laughs> kind of abstract and high level. But ChatGPT was then able to use that as an authority above other types of knowledge that it had. And it was speaking in some sort of novel terms that we come up with in that paper. And it was answering questions based on, you know, with the context of all of that information sort of in its mind, if you will. And I think I really see that kind of activity happening a lot over the next month. So, you know, with the concerns about like, well, what is the truth? Well, if I can kind of like minimize my use and focus on um, sort of, you know, my day in, day out or my business use cases for this, I can sort of kind of flag those areas where I need some objective truth, whether that be some, you know, facts about how my company works or some facts about how my day works or, you know, whatever, my take on uh, American history, my authoritative source for that, as an example. Um, and you can, you can load that in so that you're getting that appropriate objective context, right? So I think that to me is encouraging that we're starting to see tools that, you know, the concern at the beginning of the year was like, why should I trust Chat GPT, Chat GPT on everything? Like, who are they to say what's right and what's wrong? It's like, yeah, well, now there's some tools that we can sort of extend even their model. Um, to, you know, to focus on getting something more accurate for how you want to use it. So, yeah, but I think it's, it's definitely here to stay. And um, it is kind of, it is kind of this blur, right? Like, I, you know, uh, Bruce brought up the example of like the iPhone. I, for, I, I, I'm forgetting the exact details, but you know, there's someone that wrote this quick story, like how long it took, you know, to have 50 million iPhones. And it's going to be like 10x faster for 50 million users for chat GPT. Like just the curve of adoption for this thing has been, you know, higher than any other tech technological product in the history of humankind. Right. So mm -hmm. it's like, that's, that's fast. And, um, but I think that just adds fuel to it's not going anywhere for sure. Yeah. Faster than the wheel. All right. Let's do some Q and a Roger. And on, I hope I pronounced your name properly. You've had your hand raised sir, for a while. Um, yeah, thank you. Yep. Thank you. The anon, I think, is just short for anonymous because I didn't put my <laughs> sur surname into it. I mean, some people seem to think that AI presages the sort of the apocalypse. So I'm less concerned about the potential benefits and threats of AI in liberal democracies than I am about how we protect ourselves from its use by malevolent entities in rogue jurisdictions. I've never come across anybody willing to discuss this. I mean, everybody here seems to be more or less decently, ethically driven individuals. But does anyone have any ideas about how we protect ourselves in this situation? Hmm. And that's open for anybody that wants to weigh in. Well, and let's I, I start think, with you. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Mike. I was just to say, I think we're. I think this is just an arms race. It's just like computer viruses and so forth, right? Every time someone comes up with a way to misuse the technology, then you know there'll be deployed a mechanism to defeat that specific exploit, but someone will come up with a new one and this will be a never ending battle. So I think um, I think the answer is it's, it's a permanent ongoing issue that there is not a quote solution for, right? Because there'll always be ingenious new ways to trick or manipulate these technologies. Um, and uh, all we can do is try and you know, deep visibility into what the bad actors are doing and how to, you know, counteract whatever they come up with next. But I think there's always going to be the next thing that we haven't yet learned how to mitigate. Yeah. So don't shy away from it. Lean into it. Um, don't be afraid. <clears throat> don't be afraid of the ramifications or the misuse, but lean into it. Yeah, Find I, a way to overcome yeah, the misuse with good use. Sorry, I'm not on the panel, but if I can jump in, right? Like bad content um, aimed at misleading people is not a new problem. It has existed for many years already in many countries in different ways. Um, think about you know 2016 and all the, the quote unquote fake news that was spreading and going viral because people were liking it and sharing those things. Um, is that the same problem that will happen. The only thing is that the ability to create, you know, fake content is going to be much uh, supercharged now. Mm -hmm. um, the answer to that is really establishing the provenance of content, where it came from, the trust and references. And you can see some 
um, of these green shoots in modern tech, modern social media platforms now, right? So we'll give you some examples. Uh, Twitter has a community forum now. Twitter got a lot of bad press when Elon Musk took it over, right? We all know that. But now claims made by people are fact-checked by community pretty quickly. That's a step in the right move. Uh, mm -hmm. WhatsApp messaging in India was had a big problem of misinformation because of which there were a lot of unintended political consequences that happened in the last few years. So WhatsApp introduced um, you know, some features like it'll tell you how many times, how often uh, messages forwarded, right, to prevent those kinds of things. Um, and then uh, Google barred, um, you know, and even Microsoft implementation of uh, uh, cognitive search has those features where they actually put in references that are clickable to validate that. So in, in the future, a, a solution, in my opinion, is um, trusting the right brands, right, uh, from which you consume content um, and having the <clears throat> layers also enabled by AI uh, to, you know, address some of the misinformation problem that you're referring to. Yeah. Oh, thank you. To, yeah. To add, goes off oh, and, go ahead, Bruce, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, just to, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> my, my, um, to sort of add on to that, this, this is something I've, I've thought a ton about and I, I think a lot about it. and it's probably the thing that scares me the most because like we've mentioned everyone here has mentioned already bad information bad content misleading content nothing new what we're talking about is a scale and ease and velocity problem um and i've been uh like i'm i'm a pretty big elon musk detractor but i'll give twitter credit for the community notes it's 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 a step in the right direction um, I think there's going to be a real reckoning with the way that we as a society use these sort of large scale content platforms and then also how we govern them. It, it's the only path I see going forward to where that there's um, especially large Western companies, Facebook, Twitter, um, these sort of uh, Google with YouTube, they uh, they're they there's an outsized attention and paid to content moderation and sort of us uk eu nations and things like that but these things have very widespread reaching arms and you'll see things like facebook's impact in myanmar or other places where their content moder moderation team might not speak the language they might have three people in the entire com country responsible for moderating an entire sort of nation's <laughs> worth of misinformation so there, there has to be some sort of recognition whether that's through like social pressure like capitalistic pressure or regulation where if you are playing in the sphere of content generation and propagation, if you want to be held, we need to hold to a higher standard of how people can use tooling and better respond and make sure you have like a significant footprint in the places that you touch. And that's just to start because otherwise we're gonna get a lot of like, oh, we're trying, but it's hard. And I think that's an unacceptable answer in the way the world is now going to be soon. Yeah, yeah. No, I totally agree with that. You know, and, you know, with regard to governance, I'm aware of some acts that are being presented um, as legislation, like the Algorithmic Accountability Act. That's been around for, I don't know, it's been floating around in, in the, the House, um, I think over a couple of years now. Um, that was before this whole thing served up. I got to suspect that there's going to be a lot of legislation coming down the road. And how about if we're not surprised by needing to comply with this by starting to be ethical now with the way we start to use this stuff? Yeah. I, I, not to be too contrarian, so I'll keep it high level. I think it is it, it Thomas Sowell says, you know, there are, um, there, there are no solutions, only trade offs. And I, I think. You know, that's certainly the, the case with technology. I'll just do just kind of the nearest sort of big fuzzy technology if you think about crypto and blockchain, right? Um, you, you know, we went through the whole phase of this sort of similar discussion there. It's like, oh my gosh, you'll do, you know, there'll be criminality and money laundering now because we have we have crypto and that, that would be sort of, you know, the trade-off is you have, you know, people in countries all over the world now that are able to transact in ways uh, with autonomy that they were never able to do before. So there's like a straight trade-off. And, and of course, money laundering was, you know, in existence long before crypto was, just like misinformation has been in existence 
you know, long before ChatGPT came along. So like we sort of struggle with these sort of same challenges and to Bruce's point, yeah, it may be accelerating. Um, but yeah, my concern is that we overreact kind of maybe getting back to the core of, of uh, sorry, that was Roger's question. Sometimes we overreact and lock everything down and then we lose innovation and other maybe possibly more malevolent actors and, you know, places foreign domestic may not stop, right? Like, so then you you lose sort of the edge to be able to, um, you know, have a counter uh, to to sort of those sort of bad effects. So yeah, I think we have to, I think the cat's sort of out of the bag. I mean, there's so much going around now. So I think we have to like put our thoughts to how, I, I feel that regulation is generally only only solves problems in the past is is generally yeah. very bad at solving you know sort of unknown problems in the future. So I, I think, yeah, it's it's moving fast, you know. Um, so uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how we as a, you know as a society, particularly in the West, sort of like handle and balance this. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's definitely trade offs. Right? Yep. I love that last observation. I mean, you know, legacy um, um, events prom promulgate legacy regulations, right? So we have this huge event. Let's put a rule around that yeah. so that never happens again. I'm not trying to say that we can't craft like reasonable, re you know, regulation. I'm just saying, you know, if we're talking about, you know, probabilities a lot on this, on this call, <laughs> the, the, the probability that we'll nail it is, is pretty low. That's not to say that it can't happen. And it's certainly worth thinking and um, I mean, these are tough questions, right? Uh, that we have to think through. About. Hey, Mike, I want to throw on one one thought on the trade off thing because this is back to where you can't let the hysteria drive you one way or another. Mm -hmm. You know, people get all uptight about you know models are going to be losing all their income now because people use fake models. But you know, the example I like to use is you go on Amazon today. Most clothing isn't modeled by real models because it's too expensive to put real models in the clothing. But with this generative AI, you're going to be able to see all of the clothes on a model and on a model that you can ask to be of your body type, of your skin tone, of your hair type. So it'll actually be quite useful. So I'd argue that overall, there's probably more benefit to having a ton of fake models out there on demand that allow everyone to get a better clothing experience than to protect those small amounts of, of model income. But on top of that, someone's going to get paid and have a job that currently doesn't exist to build, maintain, and manage the model generation algorithms that sit behind those type of sites. And so mm -hmm. there's new jobs that are going to get created. And so there's always going to be people hurt on one side of something somewhere. Yeah. But you have to also look at all the positives that can come out. And I think in a lot of these scenarios, the positives will outweigh the negatives. That doesn't mean that the negatives won't exist, but I think the positives will outweigh it and we'll find a balance where it's actually working pretty well, albeit with a little bit of bumpiness. Mm -hmm. And we're all accountable to weigh in, to lean towards the positives as a society. That's my input. <laughs> Gentlemen, fascinating dialogue. Amazing. And I'm looking forward to, you know, we ought to touch base in like about two days and see if things have changed. <laughs> <laughs> Kalia, back to you, girls. Yeah, this, I mean, the, the chat is like lighting up. So I want to mm -hmm. open the floor. I realize that we're at time. I thank everybody so much for joining us. If you have to drop, absolutely drop. Um, but for those that want to stay on, I'm sure we can spare another few minutes to open up the floor for um, some additional questions and seeing so much uh, back and forth on the chat. So if anybody has anything else to say, please raise your hand or let us know. Um, we can unmute you or you can unmute yourself and join in the conversation. And in the meanwhile, I will say thank you, everybody. Oh, Robert, Robert's um, ready to talk. Thanks, uh, fantastic session. Um, I'm, I'm gonna go back to, I guess, Bill, I think it was your comment uh, about this sort of being an arms race and kind of reminds me of, and I'm gonna age myself here, you know, those organizations who decided not to get um, on the internet a website in the late nineties. <laughs> um, so organizations kind of having to move forward with this. And so my immediate thoughts are around, you have use cases on sort of that personalization, recommendation engines, fraud detection, augmented analytics around data. Where does this, where does it fit within enterprise architecture for an organization? 
because the demand for it is going to start coming in from business users. <clears throat> and from an enterprise architecture, you want to think through how to manage this because this is very resource intensive and, and potentially expensive. Anybody, feel free to jump in on that one. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on this one because this is something that I've been thinking about constantly. Like there's a, uh, um, we've been getting, we've, I, I've gotten like, I think maybe four or five emails from customers in the past month of essentially to the vein of when are you going to put chat GPT inside my data type stuff. Um, and I, I've been thinking around this a lot and the, the sort of the prescient use cases that are popping up are in areas where it's the more the interface layer to a product or something like that. So not necessarily the core product capability, because when it comes to building a like, sort of leveraging generative content as a capability, I think there's still a lot to learn of how to manage that just from like a tooling perspective. The idea of if I wanted to have, depending on what the feature was and what people are expecting from it, questions of, like you mentioned, how do I manage that process? How do I make it reproducible? How do I do a degree that I can? How do I monitor cost? How the big one, how do I test against that? How do I build an operational system to test that as we're going? Um, as far as I know, there like this, I had a conversation with some of some people from Google the other day and asking the same question essentially, how do I write a unit test for hallucinations? Do you have you guys solved that problem yet? And they were just like, if you solve it, go build that company and sell it. Like, yeah, that was their answer. Because um, I think that those types of things, which are sort of the unsung heroes of like building like and sustaining an enterprise grade product sometimes can be often forgotten, but they're really what actually gives you longevity and the ability to scale. So I think those are open questions when it comes to things like that. There are mm -hmm. some areas where I think customers will probably be a lot more forgiving if you say, if you slap in generated by AI sticker on the various parts of the feature, um, if that, it sort of depends on how high stakes it is. We've had internally at Caliber Mind, we've had a lot of interest in, man, I, we are a data warehouse with a lot of marketing analytics and stuff on top of that. And they're like, man, I'd love just to be able to ask questions about my data in there. Under that problem, there's a lot of modalities that go on. Uh, I can give GPT, I can give BARD data, I can give it some context, but when you start asking it to do analytical calculations, that's not what it's built for. So until we have a better pathway for managing that, whether the SQL translation layer, then how do you check that? There, there's just a whole host of, if you say seven is the answer, how, how am, do I know I'm not just lying to my customer and spiking that. So mm -hmm. I think that's where there's going to be a lot of sort of picks and shovels movement in this space and not maybe not the fancy, oh, here's my new stable <laughs> diffusion model type thing, but the how do you build these into real platforms? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, the, a comment that came in uh, on the chat, Mukul was confirming, you know, thus the plugin economy. And, uh, Bill, you mentioned the plugins earlier too. Uh, we're on uh, Wolfram. Yeah. Yeah. Any other thoughts from the messes? This has been a fantastic conversation. Oh, we have, uh, I think, well, Miranda. Okay. You're raising your hand, Miranda. Get after it. <laughs> you want me to unmute you? Ask to unmute you. This is what the button says. Yes, thank you. Um, I agree about uh, just the applicability, <laughs> for lack of a better term, um, for you know people have their data on their servers or in the cloud or whatever, and to get it to migrate to somewhere where it can be um, cleaned better and uh, you know sequenced and and able to be put into some sort of model where you're able to then feed it to a different system, an LLM or whatever to predict and all of that. Um, you know, when AutoGPT and all these things came out, people were so excited, it's going to do all this stuff for me, but we're finding out with permissions and access requests and all this stuff, it's just not as plug and play as we would like. Um, so like those plugins, you know, I think Sam Altman even came out and said, we thought that people wanted apps for ChatGPT, but they wanted, you know, ChatGPT to be built into their already, you know, created systems. Um, so with the, the Wolfram plugin, that sounds really interesting. Um, and as far as the alignment goes, I know that 
if you want to help train it to hallucinate less, more close context questions are certainly going to help. Um, ones that it can very it can answer very easily but if you get it to you know create me a fiction story about you know two kids that are lost in the woods then it's going to be kind of trained on hallucination because you're just getting it to kind of make things up regardless so getting it even if you want to you know train an internal llm or a chatbot for you is you know train it on closed ended questions mm -hmm. and then the last thing i want to say because i feel like i'm kind of all over the place is um it's I wonder, you know, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, they already have so many, uh, you know, tech stacks, you know, they're, they're great. Their platforms are already set to start incorporating AI even more. So they're going to beta things. I mean, you can already use uh, ChatGPT and Sheets and Slides and Docs and all of the other things and they can export to each other now, which is wonderful. So where do we think, you know, startups or outside influences can come in and try to take any sort of that market when there's already been such precedent set and they've already captured so much of it. Mm. There's a big open source movement. So uh, there's going to be a lot of available tools for the smaller companies to experiment with. I guess yeah. my question for that is, you know, they already are paying for Microsoft. So it's another $10. But if they have to onesie twosie, you know, a bunch of other different platforms, is that going to be challenging? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I agree with, let me see that, uh, what, what Edward said. I mean, I think, you know, the, the open source pipeline takes a bit. If you want to, you know, think back how long Linux or some of these big data products over the last 10 years, to, you know, it takes, takes them some time and you end up finding that a lot of the sort of traditional software enterprises take them on and like re rename them. So I think, I, th I think we have to let that play out a bit. And, uh, Obviously, you know, at least some of these base models are, you know, 10, 15 million dollars to do to do a training session. I think to get to your core question, though, where we're small players, and I think I've seen this, um, can, can get in. And it's not just for chat GPT. I was looking, you know, some of these other sort of corporate LLM uh, models have the notion of a plugin too. But how can you add value for your niche, right? So, you know, Wolfram Alpha is obviously a big one, um, but, you know, DoorDash is in there. Um, which is obviously they have their own product, but you can think about certain areas where if you have sort of up trained a model to do a particular thing and you can become a trusted entity, I think that's where the smaller players are going to get into this ecosystem by tapping into that sort of extension. You know, like, you know, if you can think ChatGPT sweet spot, not to say that they're not trying to get into the knowledge area too, um, but there, you know, there, there, it's around the understanding and the communication and um, and the generative aspects of it. And where I think they're looking to that broader ecosystem is those specific things that you want Chat GPT to do really well and maybe authoritatively that it can't do today. So I don't know. I mean, that's kind of just like my rambling perspective on that. But I, I see a lot of players doing. Here's like one crazy example. Um, going back to my story about like personal productivity. I am a drawer. Like I, I, I talk to these guys at GDM all the time about getting out my crayons and like drawing pictures. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a very, I, I think, you know, visuals are very important in the types of work I do day in and day out. And it takes time to make a clean visual. And there's, forget the name, I don't have the screen open right now, but there's a player that like their niche on top of chat GPT is to build diagrams from text. Mm -hmm. So like there was two of them out there, one sucked, one was really pretty good. Like I could actually get an SVG out and like, you know, tweak it. And you know, like Mike and I were talking earlier, I can do the other, the top 20%, but it did the 80% for me, just me just describing a workflow diagram that I wanted to put together. So I think, I think this is another one of those sort of ecosystem plays that it seems like open API is going to swallow the world, but I think they're smart enough to take the approach that we don't want to close this thing off. We want to make an ecosystem that people can add value to because at the end of the day, it just keeps Tyler on chat GPT because that plugin now exists um, for that, for that smaller player. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These, these companies are like the Microsoft's, the Google's, the Facebook's like these ones they're at, they will, they're started to, and will continue to take on sort of the classical aspects of a utility with the commodification of these sort of base technologies. You see a lot of the cloud providers at a certain point. I mean, the whole idea of cloud agnostic movements is like, I don't care if you're using Lambda or whatever the Lambda equivalent over in 
in someone else's serverless function, like change the name, you try to find something that doesn't lock you in as much. Um, and hopefully you can bounce between or use multiple ones, but it's sort of this availability of resource. And then it becomes like, what do you do with that resource? So sort of an edge case example, which I've, I've heard some rumblings of, which is a very similar to what Tyler was just describing. So I, I run a monthly Dungeons and Dragons game for my friends. I've done it for years. Asbro is the owner of that IP and property. And they've, I, Hasbro, traditionally not a technology company. They're a massive brand and toy company. They, they've been making pushes more into digital spaces, especially with COVID. There's a huge popularity. There's a DMV movie. Like this has been a mass. It's one of their billion dollar brands. There's some rumblings now that they are looking for technologies or companies or build, trying to buy it and build it themselves of essentially taking their massive corpus of all their adventures, their content, all that stuff, mm. and being that niche on top of a sort of an LLM interface to where it's the there the product is the experience the ability to talk and interact with it so i would not be surprised if that comes out in the nearest future where that is the augmenting of these sort of traditional offline brands and media providers that's like oh hey here's a way to play in our imaginary virtual world on top of it so it's the evolution of sort of interaction interactivity in gaming video games board games whatever so it's the I think you'll find those examples and cases of, in a wide spectrum, especially even outside of traditional like technology spaces, which I know I'm biased to think about because that's where I work and have played for two decades now almost. Mm -hmm. So it's the that's the way I think about it. So it's going to be really interesting to see who can use the means of production and not have to pay ten million dollars, fifteen million dollars to train a model in the hopes that they can do this, but just like find something, retune it try to get an iterative prototype up and see how they can do it. You know, I was just having a thought, you know, th there was an earlier comment, I think Bruce, it might've been you, you know, it was like language is our vehicle for communication, which is probably the most inadequate vehicle to truly communicate what we're really feeling and thinking. When is this thing gonna be able to just plug into our thoughts? Probably, probably not too soon, but I'm going to get a Microsoft Connect and just hook it up into it and just sort of like <laughs> have it interact with my my movements and gesticulations and see if that works. I mean, at the end of the day, it's all just electricity, right? Let me just plug it in my thoughts and get my ones and zeros out of my head. But amazing stuff. Any other thoughts out there in uh, virtual land? Spider? Ms. Spider? Thanks, guys. I have to run, but I appreciate this session. Thank you, Ed. Thank you for dropping in. Yep. I recently did see an article. I just posted it about uh, them using AI to non-invasively read thoughts by translating <laughs> thoughts into text. It's actually really fascinating. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. Um, maybe we'll, we'll round it out with one last question. We have a last question coming in from Reno. It says, how much of an edge will proprietary data have long-term when models start learning from each other? Thoughts on that panel? Well, I, I think this ties to something we talked a little bit about earlier, which I think is a concern, which is everything kind of regressing to an average, right? So <clears throat> when... Chat GPT generates you an article about generative AI, it's kind of going to give you an average answer that averages out what everybody else said. And if that average document then becomes part of the training data, along with thousands of others, similar ones that have been generated, we could have a feedback loop of regressing to the mean where everything just starts to sound really similar, dull, and you know, and potentially boring if we're not careful. Not, not to mention you're polluting back to it. If AI is training on the same output of other AI, that output from the other generative AI isn't really a fact or whatever else. It's been generated from the same underlying training data. And we we risk counting you know, things way too often um, as another reference of fact when all it really is is a re someone repeating, retweeting, reposting, which is very different. And we have to find a way, I think, to differentiate those. Mm. I, I think, I mean, these models don't get trained very frequently. Um, you know, I saw, I saw, uh, I don't know if anyone saw it, uh, but Sam Altman had, uh, did a podcast with Lex Friedman. I know, I know he's done a few of them, but it was a pretty, 
sort of an in-depth sort of nerdy one. And, and he was kind of saying the, you know, another 100 billion or 200 billion parameters isn't going to make GPT-4 better. So like where OpenAI is working, right, is not necessarily on that core training of how to understand English and obviously all these other languages as well. Um, it's, it's more on, you know, how do we get it better at understanding how to generate code and this and that and the other things. So there's, again, I think that space of knowledge is kind of going to be on one of those upper layers that I think there's a whole bunch of different ways that we'll be able to go. But I think those core big models are going to try to get better at sort of like those functional things, not necessarily that it's going to constantly be like, you know, how can I get better? You know, I stopped training GPT-4 in 2021. Like, how do I get the knowledge of 2022 in there? I don't really think that's the focus of at least OpenAI's approach. Because um, again, every day you're going to be out of sync, right? With with the most recent corpus of new knowledge that's that's available on the interwebs. Um, so yeah, it'll 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 be interesting, like how that evolves from a knowledge perspective, but I almost kind of, in my mind, I'm thinking about those as separate things that there's sort of this communication aspect that I think they've, at least they believe they've kind of nailed. And then there's this knowledge aspect where I think a lot of these questions have been hitting, right? Like how do we manage sort of the upper layers of, mm -hmm. of, of the modeling and the add-ons? Yeah. Uh, Did we have another question from Miranda? Well, I was just going to speak on that a little bit too, which is why I think, and I joined late, so I'm sorry if you already talked about um, smaller models being trained, you know, they just don't have this, uh, the big parameters, uh, don't cost as much, aren't as time intensive. Um, hopefully those will help things a little bit, but I do think that everyone is very, very caught up in uh, LLMs, and I think there's good reason to be doing so, uh, but uh, yeah, the the more exciting things and the potential scary things that are think people talked to you earlier are when it's taking, you know, like meta, when it's taking sound and images and text and layering them all in together, because that, I think that's how people think that it's going to be taking over the world. I'm not quite sure. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, to get back to the original point is, uh, and I think someone linked to the article that I was going to reference anyway. It's, yeah, it's like the giant game of telephone. If they keep training on slightly, not wrong or not biased, but just very bland, boring information that doesn't have much of a sway. Like, you know, Google, wherever, they're biased as well, but at least you're able to read different uh, points of view and then take it for what it's worth. Some of the people that are playing with it right now are just thinking, oh, whatever Google bar tells me, that's what I'm going to believe. And that scares me probably more than anything else is that we're going to outsource our critical thinking. But but even there, and, 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 and again, I agree with everything you just said. I would just, I think that's just an extension of a problem that we already had with Google or Bing search, right? Like you mm -hmm. have to be critical of the search results you get. Like, you know, I read through things. I'm like, ah, that doesn't sound right. And I'm like, we're gonna look at a couple of other sources. So I, I think, yeah, you're right. It just, it becomes harder because now we have non-humans potentially creating this content that we have to filter through in our search mm -hmm. or whatever. But I think from the model, I don't think we're going to have the the problem with these models. I mean, if you look if you look at the lower levels of how they're built, there's there's a tremendous amount of frankly making bad choices that are purposely put in like OpenAI's model because yes, when they look for the most probable response, it was boring because it was boring. So, you know, they're playing in this, you know, the 70 to 80% probable realm and like randomizing through that among other reasons to make sure you get a different answer every time, but, but also just to make the answers more exciting. I mean, so that's, yeah, it's, it's a big, it's a big, it's a big thing. It'll be interesting to see. I'm curious, like what GPT 4.5 or five will be. And if they, if the link, the core language model actually trains, or sorry, changes, um, it'll, it'll be interesting to see. And one thing, sorry, just because I'm rambling. Um, <laughs> Mike, Mike can shut me up in a second. But you talked about the smaller models, and that's actually a really good point. Um, you know, they have some of these smaller, and not small, just smaller models that can run on an iPhone now, and they're shockingly good um, in terms of their ability to understand language too. So I think they've there's a lot of innovation happening, and I forget who talked about the open source, kind of on those other alternate smaller models. They're just 
not as exciting and not gathering a lot of the headlines, but it'll be interesting to see sort of what you can do in isolation, right? When you're talking about, you know, if you can layer your own um, training data on top of one of these smaller models, is it good enough conversationally that you can actually play in the enterprise without having to engage, you know, one of the one of the big folks in, uh, you know, Google or OpenAI. So yeah, mm -hmm. there's, we didn't really get into that, but that actually, I'm glad you brought that up because there's an interesting thread um, on, on those smaller models too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, this is this has been a wonderful talk. We are like 20, 22 minutes over the time, going strong. Mm -hmm. I think we'll we'll call we'll call it here. I know it's getting late for everybody, especially for Roger. Who's yeah, Roger. With us it's after midnight. midnight for Roger. <laughs> Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. But I want to thank our panelists so much. I want to thank our guests. I want to thank um, the attendees. A lot of people really vocal in the chat. Everything is mm, going to be mm. saved. Um, we'll send a follow up with it to, to everybody. We can share links to the recording when it's live. We're going to be saving the chat as well. So thank you everybody for joining us for this conversation. Mike, I feel like you're you're right. Maybe we should do this. I don't know every couple months, at least quarterly, because this is going to change so much. Like, it's, it's like every every Monday, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Right. That's it. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Um, and I wish everybody a wonderful evening. Thanks, Thanks everyone. So much. Gentlemen, Thanks all. Great job, Dave. Thank you.